Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, all right, so remind me to go back to this slide at the end of class because I know that more students will be joining. Um, but the very first thing I want to say is um, here's our agenda. We're going to review the expectations of the persuasive essay. We're going to look at where you should be now, and I'm going to teach you about counter arguments, which involves a fair summary, a concession, a refutation, and a rebuttal. So we're going to go over all that today. But first, so this class, Rhetoric, is actually two college classes. And we're about done with the first college class. We have two more papers to submit. One will be submitted a week from Friday. And then we will rewrite that paper when we come back from Christmas break and we are done. Okay? Those two papers count for 50% of the course grade. So there's still a lot of points out there for you to get. But we have to register for next semester. So I know that there are some of you who have struggled a lot with the first semester. This was not what you expected. If you are planning on transferring out of this course, I need you to talk to your counselors now because we are registering on Friday, okay? And you don't want to register for the course if you're not going to take it. Does that make sense? I don't really want any of you to transfer. I want you guys to stay. You're doing the work. You are learning what college is like you are getting this experience, and I think that you're doing really well. But I do know that it has been really hard for some of you, especially if you're taking care of brothers and sisters, if you're trying to hold a job at the same time, I get it. So if you leave, I'm absolutely not going to judge you at all. But the, what you need to do is you need to talk to your counselors now so that you can um, transfer out, okay? We need to get that process started right now. Um, you will likely move to an AP course or to an on grade level English course, depending on what you and your counselor decide. If you move to AP, one of the choices is AP Lit, which I also teach. The other choice is AP Lang, which Ms. Um, Miller Carpenter teaches. So um, those courses are difficult, but they are, the pacing is a lot better in them than the college course. So that is just information for you guys to think about. Again, I would really not want to see any of you go, but if you feel like this isn't a good fit for you, that is okay. Any questions about that? Okay, so I'm giving you guys a day or two to think about it before we register, yeah? Next, let's talk about the persuasive essay. This is what we're working on right now. This is going to be four to six pages. It's MLA formatted. It's got a work cited. You're going to present at least two reasons and evidence. You're going to present reasons and evidence to a specific audience using at least two credible sources. You're going to have a concession, reputation, rebuttal to a credible opposing viewpoint. That's what we're going to talk about today. That's why that's bold. It's going to be peer reviewed. You're going to have a specific arrangement tailored to a specific audience. Okay, so here's where you should be. You should have completed that pacing guide. You should know who your audience is. Where are you going to publish? And you should have filled out that audience worksheet. You should have planned your argument. Here are the claims and reasons I think I'm going to use. You should have read and taken notes on the different types of argument. There's a chart. Um, induction, analogy, difference, definition, causation. You're going to try and use at least two of those methods in your paper. And you should have started writing your paper according to the classical outline. Okay, so that's kind of where I'm thinking you guys are. Um, our paper needs to be finished by Monday, so you can peer review it on Tuesday because it is due on Friday. Okay, um, that doesn't mean it has to be perfect, that just means you have to have it complete enough to get it peer reviewed because you are turning in the peer review with the paper. If you get it peer reviewed on Tuesday, that gives you Wednesday and Thursday to rewrite, tighten it up, meet with me, go to the writing center, whatever you need to, so that you can submit on Friday. Because this paper is worth 20%. Okay, it's, it's worth a lot of points. 
Anybody have any questions so far? Okay. All right, then let's talk about the counter argument. So all of this is, let me give you first, let me give you the slides. If you want to follow along with me, here are the slides. Okay. If you want to go to Canvas, we are going to be, today we're just doing module five. We're doing the whole module in one day. Okay. So if you want to follow along with me and the notes I'm giving you, they're all com coming from module five. So here is module five. Those are the two things that you need, I think. Okay. So the most convincing argument is a good counter argument. All right. It's a counter as in against. So the most convincing argument to your audience isn't going to be your reasons. It's going to be why the other side's reasons are flawed and why your reasons are better. Are you with me? Okay. It's got strategic value. And it'll show your audience that your argument isn't just persuasive. It's the most persuasive. And that gives you a better chance to convince the audience. So consider a boxer who never steps into the ring. That boxer isn't going to be as good as one who spars regularly, as one who practices um, with an opponent. Same thing, a speaker who never addresses an opposing viewpoint isn't going to be as strong a speaker, as strong an orator, as strong um, a persuasion as a seasoned debater, one who practices regularly. A productive disagreement means that you defend your viewpoint without offending those who think differently. This takes practice and skill. So when you are giving your counter argument, you need to make really certain that you don't offend your audience, all right? Which is why it's really important that you know your audience. If your audience is hostile, you're going to tread very carefully here, right? If your audience is sympathetic, you still don't want to appear like a bully, all right? So how do you do this? Well, you pick a strong opponent. So in all of the sources you've read about your subject, what you need to find a source that is opposing your position. And you um, don't want to pick like a, a foolish source or a weak source because then you look like a bully, right? If you don't attack or respond to a strong claim, then you look like you're just picking the weakest link to attack and that does not cast you in a good light. So you want to pick the strongest argument and you want to fairly represent it. If you simplify their argument and don't fairly represent it, that's called the straw man. And I have a picture of a scarecrow here. Um, that means you're not fighting a real person, you're fighting a dummy and that's easier to defeat. So you look weak when you oversimplify your opposition's argument. You'll appear untrustworthy, all right? So don't do that. You really want to dig into that opposing argument and present it as fairly and accurately as you can. You with me? Okay. That is goes back to module 1.2.2 if you need any help with that. Let me walk you through, or let me show you an example. Okay. Here's an example from the College Board. Uh, I'm not from the College Board, from OnRamp, okay? Um, on how to fairly represent a claim. So let's pretend that we had two students here who were discussing uh, climate change. And the first student says, um, organic food, sorry. And the first student says, people should only eat organic food because it's better for their health and the environment. The second student exaggerates that claim, blows it out of context, so it's not a fair representation. And they say, all people should eat only organic food because it's better for their health and the environment. Even people who cannot afford organic food should eat only organic food because it's better to starve in a developing country than to eat non-organic food. 
her student says, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. Let me try again. People in the United States who can afford organic food should eat only organic food because it's better for their health and their environment. And the second student exaggerates again and says, if people can afford to eat organic food, they should eat only organic food because it's always healthier and better for the environment, even if it takes a lot of fossil fuels to transport it to your supermarket. The first student says, no, 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 that's not what I meant. I was trying to say that if you can afford it, Organic food produced locally in the United States is better for your health and the environment than non-organic food. So that last statement is the best statement. It's the best representation of it. And if you can think about your opposing viewpoint in that way, you want to stay away from words like all, everybody, um, making those generalizations, and you want to be really specific. But this might be a good exercise with you. Imagine having that conversation. You summarize it, and then can you exaggerate that summarization? Can you restate that initial summarization so it's more clear? So eventually you get down to something that cannot be misconstrued, which is this last argument. Okay, how are we doing out there? Do you guys have any questions for me? Have I lost you? Megan, we doing okay? Hayden? Yeah? Okay. Okay. If you, you know, get lost, I'm recording this video and I'll upload it. And you have the modules that you can read. Okay, what I'm giving you is a summary of this entire module five. Okay, but that's step one. You have to fairly represent the viewpoint. Then you can start to attack it. And the first way that you attack it is with a concession. That's the willing and open admission that you cannot or do not want to argue about certain things. I agree with you on this point. Doesn't mean I agree with your whole argument. It means I agree with you on this point. Let's start where we have common ground. So here are some ways to respond to a concession. This is module 5.2. You can find more information here or more detailed information. You can explain that your concession in no way undercuts your argument. Yes, I agree with you, but that doesn't address my argument over here. You're right on this point, but it doesn't affect my argument, my claim. You can explain that the parts to which you conceded actually support your argument. You're right here, and that actually supports what I'm saying. You can explain the concession in forms of common ground on which you can build a new consensus. I agree with you here. Let's build on that agreement and see if we can't change your thinking about this other thing, okay? So what you guys are gonna do is you're gonna complete a concession discussion board. It's in 5.2, okay? So here we are in module five, and if we go to the discussion board, I will drop it in the chat. You have two discussion boards to do, okay? I'm so sorry, you guys can't see mine. Okay. There's the discussion board. All right, it looks like this. Okay, you're going to actually find your viewpoint and you're going to write a concession. Here's an example from Jude Clemente's Cap and Trade is Fraught with Fraud. The European Union created its own cap and trade emissions trading scheme in 2005. Carbon dioxide emissions have fallen, but not as fast as they have in the US where no such scheme exists and where population and US economic growth has been faster. The results of the EU cap and trade are obvious. Residential electricity prices per kilowatt hour, Denmark at 42 cents, Germany at 40 cents, Spain at 31 cents, and the United Kingdom at 25 cents, compared to the US at 12.5 cents. The concession. The Ju Clemente, who writes about energy policy for Forbes magazine, argues that a cap and trade system to reduce carbon emissions would be costly and ineffective. He notices that the European Union created a cap and trade system in 2005 with results that were lower than expected. He also notes that greenhouse gas emissions in Western Europe have fallen, but not as fast as they have in the US, where no such scheme exists and where the population and economic growth has been faster. Clemente is right. Cap and trade is costly and it may not be as effective as we hope, but that's no reason to give up on the idea. 
we should be willing to pay a little bit more for electricity that does not contribute to global warming. Furthermore, as Clemente says, cap and trade works even though it does not have the huge results that supporters promise. Finally, the reductions in the U.S. greenhouse gases that Clemente notices are great, and we can do even better if we implement cap and trade system, a system that will complement the U.S. innovations in solar, wind, and natural gas. So you see here the three points of concession. He is right. It's costly, um, and it may not be as effective as we hope, but that's no reason to give up the idea. Then we go on to say that the reasons that he gives actually support my argument. And then we go on to build a common ground. We all want this cleaner power. We can build on that together. Okay, how are we doing? Any questions out there? All right, so that's, that's the first part. You fairly represent the opposition, then you concede. You give some concessions. After that, you give a refutation. This is easily paired with concession. Refuting is where we explain why your viewpoints are wrong. So we say, okay, some of your views have merit, but there are others that are wrong. And here's a way to refute the, the opposition. You can offer counter evidence of exactly the same kind. You can present evidence that leads to a different conclusion, or you can question the quality and the source of the evidence. Okay? And module 5.3 lays that out for us. And it's followed by a, um, by a discussion board, which you're going to do. So let me show you where that is. Okay, refuting the evidence. Okay. Copying, wasting to our Google content. I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you. I'm sorry. Okay, so if we go here to 5.3, Refuting the Evidence, you'll see some examples of each of these. And then you'll see um, a class activity, and you'll see this writing refutations discussion forum. That's the other discussion forum I want you to do, okay? <clears throat> so I'm going to read this example, and, and once you write these two discussion boards, these will fit into your paper, okay? UT is clearly expecting you to do this. It's one of the points on the rubric, this clear concession counter-argument um, to a strong opposing viewpoint is in the paper, okay? All right, so here's the White House paragraph. And this effort is producing results from 1990 to 2007. The population of undocumented individuals in the United States grew from 3.5 million to 11 million people. And since then, the size of the undocumented population has stopped growing for the first time in decades. Border apprehensions, a key indicator of border security, are at their lowest level since the 1970s. So that's what they're saying. Here's the refutation. Here's where we come back at them. The Obama administration has claimed that their efforts to reduce illegal immigration are producing results, noting that since 2007, the size of the undocumented population has stopped growing for the first time in decades, and apprehensions, a key indicator of border security, are at their lowest level since the 1970s. But we should not give the Obama administration so much credit for the reduction in illegal border crossings. Thousands of interviews conducted under the administration of Douglas S. Massey, a Princeton University sociologist, found that changes in demographics play a larger role. For example, Matthew noted that women in Mexico are having fewer children, so there are not as many people in need of jobs, okay? So that's refuting the point that the opposition is making. Here's what they say, here's why they're wrong. All right. Okay, so that's the next discussion board you're going to follow. For those of you that want to dive a little deeper into this, 5.4 goes into flawed arguments. For each of the types of arguments that you made, there is a uh, reasonable argument and a flawed version of that argument, okay? Um, for the induction, analogy, difference, definition, causation, for each of those arguments, there is an appropriate or, or a reasonable version of it and a flawed version of it, just like a coin, heads and tails, right? 
Let me give you an example. Um, do you guys know what an ad hominem attack is? Have you heard of that before? Okay. That's where you attack the person instead of the argument. You look at that person's character, right? And that can be an entirely reasonable thing to do. Because if you are an accountant and you're weighing in on the issue of global warming, well, you might not be credible, right? You're an accountant. You're not a climate scientist. So I'm not sure that being an accountant makes you qualified. So it would be appropriate for me to um, go after you for that a little bit, right? To question your credibility. But and I'm gonna show you a tweet that Donald Trump sent out, um, which is a good example of an ad hominem attack. So let's look at Refuting inference. Okay. Here's a tweet that Donald Trump sent out. If Hillary Clinton can't satisfy her husband, what makes her think she can satisfy America? That's an ad hominem attack because her role in her marriage doesn't have anything to do with her role as a politician or in leadership, right? So that's attacking her personally instead of attacking her qualifications for the office of president, okay? Um, so in some cases, it's appropriate to attack the credibility, like an accountant talking about global warming. In other cases, it's a flawed argument, all right? So for each of the type of arguments that you guys studied in your chart, there's a, a, a reasonable, Side to that and there's a flawed side to that. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about that, you can read 5.4. We're not going to go into it any more than that in class, okay? So concession, um, refutation, and now we have rebuttal. After showing that your opponent's position is flawed, you need to come back and reiterate your position and why it's correct. You don't want to just leave the audience to draw their own conclusion. Okay, does anybody have any questions about this? Crystal, I see your question. I'm going to answer it in a second. Okay, so we've got for counter argument, concession, refutation, rebuttal, all right? And we saw that in the student sample that you guys looked at. We saw those, those three elements in there. Crystal, and everybody else, this paper is due on a week from Friday. It's due the day before we leave for a break. You want to have a working version of this paper by Monday because we're going to peer review on Tuesday. All right? And you must have it peer reviewed just like last time. So you want to have some semblance of a paper. Um, you want to have a draft by Monday so that it can be peer reviewed. Um, and then you'll use the next days to refine that. Okay. All right, so here's what you're going to do. In Google Classroom, I have the opposition paper. You're going to craft your counter argument. You're going to select a strong opposing viewpoint and fairly summarize that. Then you're going to concede some aspects. Use your discussion board, like copy paste from it. You're going to refute some aspects. Use your discussion board, copy paste from it. And then you're going to offer a rebuttal. Remind your audience why your viewpoint is correct. All of that, you're going to copy and paste into your paper. Okay? So, what I'm having you do with this opposition paper is I am having you write a part of your essay right now. I'm just having you pull out the counter argument. Uh, that opposition element of your paper and do it separately and then you'll copy and paste it in. So again, find a strong opposing viewpoint and summarize it fairly. That is step one. Concede some aspects of it, refute some aspects of it, offer a rebuttal. Okay? Do you need help? Go to the writing center. All right? It is open today from 1.30 until 5.00. To go to the Writing Center, you have to use Zoom, and you're going to have to sign in the SSO, which is the single sign-on. 
okay? There is a video that walks you how to do that right here on our classroom stream, okay? And it's called Accessing um, the Writing Center, okay? So here's our, our homepage. It is right here, Accessing. And if you watch it, it's a two-minute video. It'll walk you through how to do it, okay? I am also available to meet with. Okay, so your essay, you're gonna copy and paste your opposition paper into your essay once you're done with it. You're gonna to continue to write your essay. You're gonna follow your pacing calendar. We're peer reviewing on Tuesday. Paper is due on Friday. All right, for those of you who came a little late to class, one more thing I wanna talk about. For those of you who were on time, you're good. But for those of you who were a little late, I need to say this. We are registering for the second semester through UT. It is a separate class. After this semester, you'll get three hours of credit if you choose to. And then next semester is another three-hour class. We're registering for that class on Friday. If you are struggling, if you think that you are misplaced, if you think, you know what, this class isn't what I thought it was, it's time for me to, to try and move out. You need to talk to your counselor now, okay? Because we're going to register, and then we are moving forward. Um, okay, I don't want you to do that. I would like for you to say, but I do understand that the struggle is real for a lot of you guys, all right? So if that is you, I want you to go ahead and reach out to your counselor or reach out to me and let me know, and we'll talk to the counselor. Um, and, and see if maybe meeting you is um, the best option. Okay, I just wanted to put that out there because the timing on this is right now. Okay, that's it for class today. If any of you need to meet with me privately, you can just drop a note in the chat saying I need to meet and I'll pull you over and we'll do some conferencing one on one. Um, if you need any other help, any assistance, um, let me know. I'll be here all class period, but at this point, you should be writing for the next hour. Okay. All right, then I will stop recording and sharing.